Okay, we were going to move on to chapter 39 till I found some more things. Yeah, well, that's where I thought we were going to go, but we got some more on 38 before I leave. <laughs> I mean, I just, uh, all this sex stuff, I just can't get my mind off of it. It just, uh, anyway, so it was, um, don't take this wrong, but I can't help but... You remember when Dr. Biggs would talk about prostitutes? He, long-legged. Every time I'd be sitting up here, you know, and i think, how does that define? <laughs> but it's the same kind of thing in this. You know, what is, what is the thing? Now, maybe it's because, you know, the dress, and we had this question of dress, sometimes... You know, there's that expression of street walkers, and, and if you see, I haven't really seen any real ones. Honest, I, and if I have, I would be like the people back there that didn't recognize that's who they were. But anyway, the image that we'll see on some TV things, the crime scene, if someone's in the red light district, as it were, the gals have very, very short skirts which may make their legs look longer. <laughs> See, they le- their legs have grown so long that it made this dress look so short. And that, that may be the, the false image. So, anyway, but a few more notes from um, <clears throat> uh, Kirsch and his uh, Harlot by the Side of the Road book. He mentions... And we mentioned last week the veil. The veil was not uh, the sign of harlotry, but in advertising, it was really the sign of a married woman or a betrothed woman. However, it's a little close since the, the woman's value and position and station in life and her own security was so pivotal around marriage and producing a male heir in this patriarchal society that the veil for a a woman was a symbol of legitimate but limited sexual availability. If she was betrothed, it meant she was going to be available to a husband for the purpose of sexual relations to produce the male offspring. So it's connected there, um, the whole image and idea. But uh, Kirsch found other symbols uh, for identifying illegitimate sexual availability, either for pay or for the pagan worship of the fertility goddess. And that other symbol would be, anybody want to make a guess? Jewelry, jewelry, could be a ring in the nose, or it could be a pendant. Now, you've seen in some places a little headdress kind of thing with a pendant hanging on the forehead, and it could have been a necklace with a pendant uh, down on the chest, Uh, but uh, we have in Hosea... uh, where God is wanting Hosea to marry a prostitute to be a symbolic image of Israel's unfaithfulness uh, and so forth. Um, but in Hosea 2, 4, put away her harlotries from her face and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked. So it suggests jewelry as as some kind of symbol. So the pendant on a forehead or a necklace uh, was could have been an identifying sign. So even with a veil, one could still see a pendant on the forehead or some kind of pendant around the neck. Uh, so uh, also, Song of Songs, he found, uh, and you know, that poem is all about carnal love and sexuality and so forth. Uh, 
that a woman might wear something around her neck, but dropping down to symbolize sexual availability in Song of Songs 113, my beloved is unto me as a bag of myrrh that lieth betwixt my breasts. So hanging down to the mid-chest. Uh, now this bag of myrrh, that myrrh and some other <clears throat> things had an aroma so it's like perfume to draw somebody in uh, to be an arousal as it were now if that were the case with Tamar one would still need to come very close to her have an encounter up close and personal to be able to see if uh, there was such jewelry if if that might be the case and, therefore, one must be looking and interested. So it's not like she went out and tackled him uh, as he was passing by. He came over to her. So, uh, still, it's no conclusive. It just leaves lots to the imagination. And that's what's fascinating about a lot of these stories. Just enough to pique our interest and make us wonder and then as people discuss and enter into dialogue and imagine how it might have been uh, is um, is the power of these stories so so we've discussed several times the other uh, aspects of the vulnerability of the barren and widowed woman in a culture of bible times uh, the patriarchy so In this story, we still have the initiative, the bravery, the inner strength of Tamar to overcome all of the obstacles, and it makes her a heroine in the tradition in spite of the incestuous conception and the fact that she was a Canaanite woman, not a true Israelite. Um, Her action and her faithfulness to the values of faith, along with the fact that her Uh, conceiving and bearing a son would end up being an ancestor of King David, King Solomon, and the Messiah, makes the point, this is a God thing. God is blessing this or orchestrating this, uh, this event. And as we see divine interventions in the Bible as setting aside natural laws, as in Sarah's case of conceiving when she's well past the age of bearing children, but here it's sometimes moral laws are set aside in special circumstances for survival. Uh, In the case of a crisis for the sake of long-term divine plan, or for history and the sake of God's people's survival in order to then be a blessing to the nations. Um, But as that issue concerns us today, it made me think that that's a, a situation that confronts faithful people all the time, that we have principles and laws and rules and values that would be in conflict because of a particular situation, uh, allegiances can be in conflict uh, where we have to decide uh, which principle should have priority when we make a decision to take some kind of action. Uh, ran across one of these, an example came from uh, my son's class. He came home and told me about it. A teacher presented a hypothetical dilemma and asked the class to discuss it. The dilemma was one you may have heard of before and maybe used for discussion starter in some class or discussion, is that your spouse has a rare and fatal disease, the cure for which is only one very expensive medication. It's kind of like one antidote to a poison, and you've got to get the antidote quickly in order to counteract the poison or you die. So this disease is, is very bad. Time is running out. And the pharmacist with this expensive medicine is charging tens of thousands of dollars 
for it and you're broke. You have two choices. Let your spouse die or steal the medicine from the pharmacist and get it to your spouse. Well, immediately, and you know how kids uh, tend to think a lot of black and white, and one of their strongest values is loyalty to friends and family. So, obviously, several of the kids said without hesitation, Steal the medicine! Save your loved one! But the teacher shot back rather quickly, Then you are not a true Christian because all of God's commands are equal. Bobby came home to tell me about it because he had the courage, or maybe the ignorance, of challenging the teacher on that statement. The risk is retaliation, which I've been warning him about uh, for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> when he was like in the eighth grade, there was a big snow day. Karen was teaching out at Phillips. They were having um, minister's week. Dom, uh, Dominic Croson was teaching a lecture. And I mean, this is Jesus seminar. I mean, big time guy. <clears throat> Bobby sat in the room with the television and watched that lecture, first lecture. Then he wanted to sit with me at the second lecture. And so he sits with me. And then at the end of the lecture, he raises his hand. And fortunately, the microphone was at the back of the room. I asked, what What are you going to... Well, Croson says, just a minute. I will get to you, but the microphone's back there. I I said, Bobby, what are you going to ask him? Bobby says, he's wrong. And the issue was that Croson was talking about uh, the Left Behind series and, you know, the evangelical kind of spin on that. And he was saying this is the only time that Christians are taking up arms to kill others. And then he did use, uh, oh, who's the, oh gosh, now I've forgotten. One of the little characters in these stories uh, It's like C.S. Lewis, the wardrobe and the thing. But one of these others, uh, gosh, I I wasn't planning to do this, just came to me. But anyway, uh, Croson had said he was, the kid was in armor. And Bobby says, no, he wasn't. He just had a sword and a shield. He didn't have any armor. He's wrong. And I said, Bobby, you do not tell the instructor in front of all these people you're wrong. <laughs> and so, anyway, he, in the meantime, before the microphone got there, you know, I waved him off. I said, no, it's okay. And then Croson said, oh, it's okay here. And so he asked a question and basically is, was saying, Bobby said, why would Christians kill? Killing is wrong. And then, unfortunately, Croson, instead of saying, exactly, you got the point. He tried to dumb it down and explain it, and it just... Anyway, but that was the point I've been telling him. You don't embarrass the professor in front of the class pointing out an error. And I told him about my dad learned that lesson in college when a geology professor was, you might appreciate this. Maybe I've told this story before. uh, He was talking about pea gravel and the uses of pea gravel. And the professor said, it's never used for roofing. And my dad raised the hand and said, my dad's a general contractor. We use pea gravel on roofs all the time. F for the course. (laughs) You do not contradict the professor in front of the class. You might go up afterwards and say something, but not in front of the class. You do not embarrass. Anyway, so real-life situations bring... uh, bring these issues before us, Um, but it's interesting to me that the teacher in his class actually demonstrated and exercised the fact that he operates on a hierarchy of rules and commandments because there are strict policies about pushing religion in the classroom upon the students. Now, if that teacher had said, you know, some people think that, and then opened it for discussion, what do you 
think or feel about that perspective. But no, it was a statement that was given in the form, this is the truth, now you accept this. And that truth was his particular take on Christianity. And even assuming the whole class were Christians, it's still pushing a particular perspective. Uh, But given the fact that there could be Jewish kids, Muslim kids, Hindu kids, New Age kids, you know, whatever, uh, to put that out there in the class, his own religious perspective as truth, um, meant that he felt like his Christian witness was a higher value than First Amendment of the Constitution, all the policies that are in the school, and so forth. So he exercised what he was saying wasn't true. He contradicted himself by his behavior. But, um, putting all that aside, the story of Tamar illustrates that within the Bible itself, all the moral laws and dictates are not equal all the time, forever and ever. Even the thou shalt not kill. God kills Ur, and he kills Onan. Now, where is it written that selfishness and greed is a capital offense. Anyway, God violates his own command twice in that story. But anyway, and the movie Selma raises the issue again of the unjust Jim Crow laws and human rights where civil disobedience, breaking the secular unjust laws and rules in order to affirm a higher law, of equality and, and uh, basic human rights. And for those who were participating, for the most part, were basing their action upon scripture, tradition, prayer, reflection, uh, discussion. You know, how shall we faithfully respond to this unjust thing? And took a peaceful, civil, disobedient uh, method. But... It was setting some rules and values higher than others. Uh, Now, the principles of patriotism and and opposing evil in the world by enlisting in the military uh, versus conscientious objection of some who personally don't feel like it's right to take another's life. Now, in the Vietnam and the Iraq War, both were questionable in terms of Were they justifiable when you measure the cost of innocent civilian lives and all the young men and women sent into harm's way of combat? Did those conflicts meet the just war theory criteria? Well, they didn't. Um, And so there were in many minds that this was not... uh, a just war, so with clear conscience, one could, on one's personal moral grounds, be in conflict with the patriotic values and notions of supporting our country and and uh, being patriotic versus the moral reasoning issues and one's faith that those came into conflict, and one has to make a choice. Um, which way will I go? Now, we know many conscientious objectors will serve in other ways as chaplains, as medics, do desk jobs, support jobs, be at home here and working in the VA to care for the wounded soldiers and so forth. Uh, However, some were cowards. Some just ran away and hid. Um, But then many were courageous by putting themselves out there protesting, calling attention to the moral issues that were still unresolved and and still under debate. <clears throat> and there were very real risks and dangers from the backlash or the pushback if one does protest. Remember the Kent State uh, tragedy where some National Guardsmen began to shoot the pay, uh, students who were protesting and, and there were deaths. Obviously, the risk of the peaceful civil rights demonstrations 
as the movie showed, some were killed, murdered. Uh, Many were blasted with the high-pressure water hoses or beaten or the police dogs turned loose on them. So peaceful protesting is risky, and even here in Tulsa, you know, occasionally people will be holding signs up at some minor major intersection where there are stop stoplights, uh, <clears throat> doing, you know, their freedom to express themselves. But even at that, there are people who will drive by and throw rocks or bottles at them, you know. And, uh, and you don't even have to be protesting. You can be riding a bike and someone will throw bottles at you or run you off the road or drive so close, you know, you've got those big mirrors on some pickup trucks that stick out so far that you can drive close enough to hit that biker on the shoulder and knock him off the road. Now, I haven't interviewed the people who do that to find out why they want to do that, but, and I've heard it expressed in some people's minds, a biker is a protester, protesting against the gas-guzzling pickup trucks and SUVs, making a statement And so, protesting sometimes is in the eye of the beholder, rather than in the actual action of the person who's viewed as a protester. Anyway, um, the basic conflict of values comes when one sees an injustice and feels compelled to speak up, to march, protest, in order to influence the policy or the behavior that one feels is unjust, with one's value, now there's a conflict, a lot of good people feel conflicted because their inner values and disposition, a way of being, is to be a peacemaker, is to be obedient and to follow the rules, to be a teamwork person, to cooperate, to live in harmony, and to create a spirit of unity, and let's all get along. However, if there is an injustice and you feel strongly about it and want to speak out or stand up or protest or hold a sign or do something, then automatically that puts you over and against the other side. And sometimes it's over and against the actors in the injustice who may not be the first line actors but secondary and they are complicit For example, I don't know if you've read about in Africa and the production of chocolates, that they have a lot of child labor doing that. So if a chocolate company like Hershey isn't doing child labor themselves, but if they buy from that supplier knowingly, then they are complicit in supporting child labor. And if we knowingly keep buying chocolate from that company that knowingly is using child labor, by supporting them and their business, we too are complicit. Now, for someone to raise that issue and to speak out about it, we'll get some backlash. If it were Hershey, I think they used to be, but I think they've corrected it. But if it were, if you loved Hershey, you don't want me to tell you you ought not to be eating Hershey's because they engage in child labor. Or if because we call for a boycott and you own stock in Hershey, that may affect you financially and you won't like that. And then now we've got a conflict because you view my protest for a, a human rights issue, a justice issue, as harming you. So... <clears throat> We run into those uh, problems, and then we've got the, the same kind of thing in the clothing uh, industry where sweatshop uh, labor, also child labor, tra- even trafficking of s- human beings of slave labor. I mean, it, the way it works out is virtually slave labor. Uh, some families are deep poverty. Someone promises to give their child a good education. And so they say, yes, they give their child, their child goes someplace and works in a sweatshop. And then if, as it comes out, you know, the article of clothing that we think is, ooh, boy, it's a good deal, I can buy it on the cheap here, it's supporting the child labor or the sweatshop. 
and if we do it knowingly, it uh, creates a problem with our conscience. Anyway, but when the conflict, when one supports or gets involved, will be in conflict with one's basic feelings of wanting to get along, to make friends, to have harmony and peace in the world. Uh, yet the values and the rules come in conflict. On this sexuality issue, we might look back to the Jewish young women and girls in Nazi concentration camps who had sex with the German soldiers hoping to get pregnant and hoping then even more that the father of the child that she was carrying had enough human decency and love for the child that he would then protect her and the child at least long enough for the war to be over. But then the risks are afterwards then being accepted and not condemned. Uh, but anyway, in these situations, uh, the Kirsch uh, lifted up uh, all those different ways of viewing, but it raised that basic issue for us and the faith question that this raises, that what are the higher values, the most important values for us to follow when our values are in conflict in a unusual situation? And it's hard. It's hard. Um, and it has to be done very carefully and prayerfully and sometimes strategically uh, to balance those things. Like in a justice issue, you could take up, let's go take up arms and go kill the evildoers. Or do we do some kind of peaceful demonstration that calls attention and gets public pressure to make the evildoers change their, <laughs> change their ways? Uh, or the economic thing, make do a boycott till they change their practices. Um, anyway, it's 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 a tough decision that people of good conscience will find themselves in from time to time. Anyway, to move on, Kirsch did some explanation and exploration of the red thread that was tied to one of Tamar's twins' hands. Um, as you remember, Tamar's pregnant with twins, and again, a blessing in the minds of ancient Israelites. Twins was seen as a blessing, a, a divine gift from God, and even more so if the twins were boys, uh, since they were valued more. But during labor, one baby's hand thrusts out, and a midwife ties a red thread around his wrist, but then the hand is drawn back. Now, I believe the red thread, or some kind of thread, when twins are being delivered, was so that you do that to the first one that comes out because that's the firstborn. It would be real easy to get these babies mixed up, and particularly if they're identical. I mean, one's a boy, one's a girl, then you, uh, you know, that's easy. You know which one came first. Or if, you know, one's hairy and red and the other one's not, then that one's easy but the practice of the red thread. However, uh, in this case, the first to present was not the first completely delivered and actually born because he withdrew the hand, and then the other baby is fully delivered first. And I thought it's kind of like a race. I don't know if you all, one of you may know the answer to this. You've got a, a foot race and a track meet. You're running. We'll say it's like an 880 or a mile. And you're running. And you're running. And you're so tired. But, and you're in the lead. And you're in the lead. But you trip. And you fall short of the finish line. But you can put your hand across the finish line. But the one behind you completely crosses the finish line before you can get up and crawl across the finish line or roll across the finish line, who's the winner? Now, in most races, you know, they string a tape, so the one who's first will thrust the, 
the the chest and there have been some photo finishes where the winner really is i mean it's just this thrusting of the chest just a little right at the last minute to get that extra inch to hit the tape when actually you know maybe the other guy's foot was on the finish line down here at the ground but you know the tape anybody know well horse races you got the photo finish <laughs> but uh but but it's when the nose crosses you know if the horse had fallen and his nose slid through the dirt and went across you know what is it the whole body crossed the finish or just some part of you anyway this is kind of like this baby thing thrust the hand out it's first out, but then goes back in, and then completely delivered and born was the other one who was first to be completely born. But technically, the one with the red ribbon is judged or deemed to be the firstborn, and that was Zara. But Perez, who was technically the second to appear, present, uh, but actually the first to be completely born is viewed as second born. But it is that second born who then becomes the ancestor of David and Solomon and the Messiah. So, if you're looking for black and white answers from the Bible, they are hard to find. <laughs> we have so many examples of not being so black and white. But this practice of the younger son, the not rightful one to claim, according to the culture's judgment, the, the primogenitor role. We have Ishmael versus Isaac. We have Jacob and Esau. And we have uh, Judah, who gives his name to the children of Israel, becomes of, from Judah we get the Jews. Um, he was a fourthborn, um, and then this secondborn Perez, uh, but he not only takes precedence over Z Zara, but we still had Shelah still alive. He was born before. And so Perez takes precedence over Er, Onan, and Shelah as far as who is the one who carries on the name and the and the story and the history. And then we have Joseph, who was the 11th born, who goes on to be so important in the story of the children of Israel. And he becomes second only to Pharaoh, who is in his culture deemed a god. So who is the most important? Uh, and who is to be rich and famous? But the red thread, we have a red thread showing up again. Anybody remember another red thread? You can get a free cup of coffee in the, par in the library if you answer. <laughs> well, it's Rahab, another harlot. And that story is that when the Israelites, when they're taken over in the land of Canaan, they're going to attack the city of Jericho. And there are two spies sent into the city to determine the strength and, and so forth. But Rahab rescues them and saves them and lies and they get to escape. And they promise her because she has been so faithful to them that if she will hang a red thread in her window that when the Israelites come and take siege and conquer the city, she will be saved. Not only she but her family. Now, we don't know who her family is, but we can imagine this may be a poor woman without a male who has children, and she has to do prostitution to survive and feed her family. But anyway, she becomes um, saved because of a red thread. So, we've got harlotry, <laughs> red threads, being saved, and is there any other way that, that she's similar to some of the other people? If you look in Matthew, in the genealogy in Matthew, 
Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba are the women ancestors named in the genealogy of Jesus. All four in their stories have questionable sexual behavior. Was God trying to clean up their act by having Jesus born by a virgin? I don't have an answer for that. That, I, I, that just popped into my head because of the, all the questions of, of sexuality. Um, well, I'll go with that a minute since it popped into my head. It might be a God thing. <clears throat> and then again, it might be Satan. But <clears throat> uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway um, one of the really unfortunate things about God Christianity and the virgin birth and uh, Paul and his writings and so forth has, there's no healthy place for normal sexuality. I mean, it's, we can't talk about it, it's taboo and so forth. So all we have is sex is dirty, sex is evil, sex is naughty and so forth. Uh, And And that's unfortunate because when you repress and suppress something natural and normal and don't give it healthy expression, then it does things and controls situations in unhealthy ways because you haven't learned to deal with it in a healthy way. And so that's one of the the problems that virgin birth... uh, and particularly within the early church and so forth, uh, happens. Now, the reality is the sex drive and sexuality is a powerful force, and it's scary. Uh, and, and so, anyway, but another part of it, it has labeled women as the cause, as the seductress, and so forth, uh, and often blame the victim in rape and so forth. So, anyway, when we get to New Testament in um, 20 years, <laughs> we, can, we can deal with that. All right, well, we're not close to the end, but we need to decide. When I took over this class, I was just going to do it for a while until David got through doing his meet and greets and then would be senior pastor and do the pastor's Bible class. And then he said, I don't want to do that. Uh, It's too much work. I got too many other things I need to do. So uh, when we get through with Genesis, I had thought maybe jumping to a New Testament book, a gospel, would be the next thing we might do. Uh, Think about it and tell me what what you all think. Uh, It'll be a few weeks or... (laughs) Or longer, I don't know. We'll we'll see how much. Uh, I only have enough time to to study and research and and work on this one week at a time. So I don't know how long it'll take. Anyway, we're we're ready. Let me just read uh, this chapter to get our minds moving ahead and and thinking. In thirty nine, now Joseph was taken down to Egypt and Potiphar. An officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. Now, we've got, when we left off, Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar. One of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, was 37, 36. So, at that point where we left off before uh, Judah went away and had all his troubles, uh, now he's being bought by the, or sold by the Ishmaelites, but everything else is the same. Uh, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master, His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. 
from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge and with him there. He had no concern for anything but the food that he ate. Now, the next line gets us into Potiphar's wife trying to seduce Joseph. But even though that's still on this sexual impropriety theme, let's look at that first part, and then we'll get to pick up again next time. Now, Potiphar buys Joseph from Ishmaelites or Midianites, according to the two different verses, which shows us that there are two different storylines that have been brought together by the uh, redactor who was the final editor of the Genesis stories. But um, this courtier or chief steward is another phrase that some interpreters will use for who Potiphar was. Um, And in a part of this whole, we see... uh, God is so actively involved helping Joseph in this version of the story. Um, But uh, everything except the food that he ate was put into his hands. Now that could be interpreted several ways because it doesn't explain it. We suspect that since Potiphar is so trusting, the food is not excluded because Potiphar is afraid Joseph would poison him or doesn't put him in charge of the food because he's a lousy cook. But rather, it is most likely a reference to the religious dietary customs that are different but from Egyptians and the, and the Israelites. But more importantly, we remember that when this is written, it's after the exile. It's not written at the time the event is being described. So this is way before Moses and the Ten Commandments and the dietary laws and don't eat pork and, and uh, you don't eat shellfish and, and all those things have come about. Uh, This is way, way, way before we would have had that. But the listeners know all of that. And if we're going to portray our patriarchs and our great leaders as honorable men that we would emulate their behavior, then this reference, everything except the food, which would give us the indication Joseph did not eat the same food that the Egyptians ate. He stuck to that faithful dietary rules that Israelites follow, even though it's anachronistic. We didn't have those rules yet, but he still was faithful to them because God was with him and God just let him know he shouldn't do that. Well, Bruce Vauder's commentary lifts up another confusing situation. The woman commonly known as Potiphar's wife This lusty lady, this woman begging for Joseph to lie with her, uh, may or may not have actually been wife because the term for describing Potiphar's relationship to Pharaoh is saris, or saris, S-A-R-I-S. It's a somatic term which usually means a eunuch, a eunuch in most cases. Now, one would think a eunuch would not be eligible or even interested in marrying. But if Potiphar had been made a eunuch after going through puberty and having his heterosexual interests fully developed, he may have still desired female company and companionship. And this woman called his wife may have been interested and willing to be his wife for all of the status and the financial security <clears throat> and benefits, this life of luxury and power, even though there would be no sexual relationship or no children from that marriage. A marriage of arrangement or convenience might have been the case if indeed Potiphar was a eunuch and also married. 
The wife person may not have anticipated the strength of her own sexual drives, or she may have planned it all along, knowing that she could have boyfriends on the side. We don't know. All of that, again, is the scriptural stories leave so much to be filled in by the imagination. They tell us certain things, but when we listen to the scholars who do word studies and show us that the way our rather prudish Bible scholars may have written in the words to give us an impression might not have been the impression that the first listeners would have had or that may have actually been the case. But whatever the case, when we get to the next verses, we realize Joseph is virtuous and he does not succumb to all of her feminine wiles. And that's the image we're supposed to have. So we'll get in more of that. Any one last minute question before we pray and dismiss? For all these sexy stories, do any of you have an illustrated Bible? Do we know what these gals look like? There it is, the illustrated Bible. All right. Oh, that reminds me. I was just thinking about, you want to hang around and let people look at that and see what the, what the pictures show us? Yeah, yeah, that'd be. Uh, we're doing lights on for uh, 